so good morning to all of you so today morning we will be reflecting on a topic called overcoming uh, unbelief i was supposed i know i was supposed to do a session on the charisms the last part the last talk is left but since last week i had a little uh, busy week i couldn't get enough time to prep, uh, prepare so we will be doing that the last part of the charism we will be doing it uh, next tuesday so today we uh, reflect on a very important topic overcoming uh, unbelief you know often times we may have heard uh, teachings on faith and how our faith blesses us uh, what are some of the blessings what are some of the benefits we receive in our life when we trust the lord but along with that we also need to know that sometimes when we are not believing the lord when we decide not to believe in the lord there are moments of unbelief in our life we also need to become aware of how it can affect our spiritual life how it can affect our relationship with the lord so in this teaching today in this session today what we'll be reflecting upon are the following points we are going to reflect on four important questions related with unbelief first we'll see what is unbelief all about when we say uh, this is a this is i am not able to believe in the lord what exactly we mean what is unbelief second we will look at what are the four effects of unbelief when we refuse to believe the lord how it affects us in four specific ways a uh, third this is a little psychology we are going to reflect on uh, why in the world why we fall in unbelief why we find it difficult to believe in the lord what are those things in our life especially in our mind uh, sometimes that may be happening because of which we find it little difficult to believe in the lord so it's a little psychological part we will look in order to understand ourselves basically we will look to understand ourselves why i find it difficult to believe the lord and the fourth question is how do i deal with unbelief how can i overcome unbelief in my life so we start this session with the first question itself what is unbelief all about and so the biblical definition of unbelief is this unbelief is refusing to believe in god and refusing to believe in his word okay it's basically a lack of faith so unbelief is a refusal to believe in god and it is also a refusal to believe what god has said now let's let's look at uh, this definition and try to find out once again our struggle with unbelief why in the world we struggle with this whole aspect of unbelief in our life because it is refusal to believe god why we don't believe god or why we don't believe in his word i want to give an example uh and through this example i just want to bring out ki why we find difficult why we find it difficult to believe the lord and i hope so all of us catch that main point for oh, this is the main reason yes there are other reasons also which you look later but this is one of the main reason i find it very difficult to believe the lord which means this is one of the area in my life i must focus on growing spiritually recently a incident happened with me just a few days back i was in a particular parish here uh, doing a session and after the session i happened to meet one of my friend <laughs> i call him my friend actually we sh- i should call him uncle or something but he's like my friend is 84 years old still comes for the prayer meetings still is able to walk move and he was there for the prayer meeting after the prayer meeting i happened to meet him we had a very long chat and he was just waiting on the road i was i thought initially that he is waiting for someone else later i realized he is waiting because he is not able to cross the road he is not able to cross the road along with his wife who was also old he is not able to cross the road because the traffic the vehicles were moving faster at that time a young man approached them and told them that he will help them to cross the road and this friend of mine right away refused this young man he said no uh, we will cross it on our own 
seeing that they were struggling for the last 15 minutes to cross the road i decided to help them out so i said you know uh, i just took his name and i said i will stand to your right means the traffic is coming from that side so i will stand on that side and right now you hold each other's hand i am holding your hand and we will all cross the road together as soon as i told him i would like to hold your hand he he caught my hand and i helped them to cross the road in fact there were two roads they had to cross i would like you to look at this incident first two people offered to help my friend one is the young man who came and decided to help them he refused them that is unbelief refused and then when i offered to help my friend he accepted that he caught my hand there is a very important lesson here you can't believe a stranger you can't believe a stranger you can only believe someone to the extent you know the person that's what happened with my friend he says i don't know this young man i've never seen him before though he must have come with good intentions to help me but there are incidences here where young people like him come to help and then they rob us you know they leave us in the middle of the road and they will pluck a, a gold chain from the neck or the purse from our pockets and run away and leave us right in the middle of the road so he says i don't know this young man and because i don't know him i never believed him in fact i refused his help and my friend knew me because he knew me it was very difficult sorry it was very easy for him to trust me why in the world we are not able to trust god because for many of us god is still a stranger yes we know a lot of things about god about god we don't know god you can only trust someone when you know the person if you don't know that someone you will struggle to trust that person and that is what happens because we don't know god we find it difficult to trust him though we may have a lot of information about god that doesn't help knowing about god doesn't help knowing god helps and this is one of the main reason why we struggle with unbelief now you can you can you cannot trust god if you don't know him you can't know him and how can you know him if you are not living with him if you are not spending time with him you can only know someone when you live with that person when you spend time with that person and that is where the whole aspect comes we sometimes are not interested i would like you to pay the attention to this word we are not interested in developing our relationship with god we are only interested in getting certain blessings from god certain answers to our prayers and that doesn't help that doesn't help why though we are experiencing blessings of god but we don't know him the next time another problem comes we will again start getting worried we will again start giving into fear we will find it difficult to trust him and so one of the main antidote what do i mean by antidote if you are if you really want to stop your struggle in the life of faith then you must work on your relationship with the lord you must work on developing your relationship with the lord and the more your relationship with the lord is developed which means you know him the easier it becomes to trust him i hope so today we have got the main reason today we have understood the main reason why i find it difficult to believe in god that's the main reason and it all goes back to i am not developing my spiritual life 
i just see god as a shopkeeper god is a shopkeeper to me where i can meet all my needs where i can solve all my problems i come to him with my prayers and my navinas that is the amount i pay god as we go to the shopkeeper we pay something and then we ask something i also all of us take our spiritual growth seriously our relationship with god seriously knowing him seriously daniel chapter 11 verse 32 is this is my favorite verse for more than 30 years of my life more than it was 30 years ago when the lord had spoken to me this word in my personal prayer when i was struggling to believe him i was going through a very tough phase in my life and i was struggling to believe the lord the problem was not a problem the bigger problem was i was not able to trust god in the problem that was a big problem and because i was not able to trust god in that problem i was not having peace i was becoming negative very negative i was becoming because now the problem is affecting me i was getting very disturbed and that was the time in my personal prayer this verse came daniel chapter 11 verse 32 which says those who know their god one of the version says and the real meaning of that verse different bibles have different translations but the me- main meaning of that verse is those who know their god will be strong in the time of testing who will be strong in the time of testing not everyone who will be strong in the time of testing those who know their god not those who know about their god being strong in the time of testing is able to try it means i am able to trust god in that time of testing and that trust helps me to be peaceful to be calm even with pain though i am having pain in my life i am having i am having pain of going through the problem it helps me to be peaceful and calm it doesn't affect me the problems negative effects of loss of peace being disturbed getting confused doesn't happen and that was gave me a goal in my life i need to work on knowing god the apostle paul in philippians chapter 3 verse 10 when he is talking about he says if today you ask me saying what is my main my main goal in life and so in philippians chapter 3 verse 10 he says i want to know him look at this he is coming to the end of his life the apostle paul is writing that when he is coming to the end of his life he has lived so many years with the lord and still he says i want to continue to know him and the power of his resurrection but if the first line he says is i want to know him the apostle paul had made this one goal in his life to know jesus to know him more and more because he knew the more he knows the lord the less he will be falling into unbelief our goal in life is i want to get from him i am not interested in knowing him i want to get my answers from him i want to get my problems solved from him and as a result our hearts are never changed our lives are never transformed yes we experience the blessings of the lord yes we experience the healings of the lord but the heart never changes Today, let's make this one goal of our life, like the Apostle Paul. I want to know Him, and that is the main reason why we are not able to trust the Lord. Remember, you can't trust a stranger. You can only trust someone to the extent you know the person. Now, once we fall into unbelief. let's look at the second part second part of this session 
how unbelief affects us. What are some of the effects of unbelief? There are four of them. The Bible talks more of them, more, but I have just picked up four because these four are major. All the other scripture verses fall in these four categories. The first, when we continue to live in unbelief, continue, I'm talking about continuously we are living in unbelief, it brings us condemnation. It brings us condemnation. John chapter 3, verse 18. John, the gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 18. Jesus said, whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Look at what Jesus is saying here. He says, whoever does not believe stands condemned. He, 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 he will not be condemned after death. His result is already declared. He is already condemned. He stands already condemned. Because, the, he goes on to say, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. I remember in one of our retreats, there was a youngster who came to me after I gave a talk on uh, confessing your sins. This is one of the sessions I do Saturday morning on how to make a good confession. And why confessing a sin is something very important part of the retreat. That's the most important part of the retreat. Your repentance, how your retreat will go, all depends upon how your confession will go. So this young man, he just came after my session and he said, uh, I won't be going for confession now. In fact, I'm not interested in making any confession now. I'm still young. I have not enjoyed my life. I still need to enjoy my life. Uh, but brother, be sure, you know, before I die, I will make a good confession. Which means I will enjoy the world. Have all the pleasures of the world. Live a sinful life in the world. And just before dying, I will make a good confession so that I get into heaven. Now, this is a trick. Sometimes we can play with God, but it's a very dangerous trick. Let me tell you why. I told a, a young man, what do you mean by confessing? Do you think that you will just say to God with your mouth, I'm sorry, and that matters? And then I gave him a shock. I said, do you know your words don't matter? You saying sorry doesn't matter. What you say in confession doesn't matter. It's how is your heart during the time of confession? Because if your heart is not right, and I'll, I'll share with you what does, what do I mean by saying a right heart, which the Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about. That we need to have a proper disposition of the heart when we are going for confession. If that heart is not right, not truly repentant, your words are invalid. I says all that matters in confession is a contrite heart. Contrite heart, that's what the Catechism talks about which means it is truly sorry for its sin. David spoke about this contrite heart in Psalm 51, which is a psalm of repentance, where he's confessing his sins, two mortal sins he had committed, sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and then he, had, he has murdered her husband. You know, all know that story. And there in Psalm 51, David is repenting. And towards the end of the psalm, David says, Oh God, you, you will not despise a contrite heart. What kind of a heart God won't despise? Contrite heart. Which means the only right disposition for repentance is a contrite heart. Now, I told this young man, the more you delay your repentance, which means he says you are not going to do it now, you'll do it later, you'll do it later, you'll do it later. Do you know what happens to you when you ignore a sickness? Can someone answer me on this group? What happens to you when you have a sickness and you keep on ignoring it? You don't do anything about that sickness. Yes? Death, death, brother. It will lead you to such an extent it will not cure. Get cured and it will lead to death. Yes, it will not be cured. In fact, your, whenever we ignore a problem, it keeps on increasing. It goes on increasing till one day it kills you. I say the same thing. 
when we keep on ignoring our repentance the heart starts getting more hardened more hardened more hardened and at the time of your death it may become more hard and we may try to just say it with our mouth which is not valid i said that's the danger you may not have a right disposition of the heart at the time of your death of course you know it sent a lot of fear in that young man once i shared that praise god because afterwards i came to know he went and made a good confession <laughs> and i i the last line i told him maybe this is your last confession you may not get a chance again you are at this retreat which means god has given you a chance to confess other place you don't know whether you will get a chance to repent today is the day of salvation the scripture says the main point i want to draw to you is when we keep on unbelieving and one of the result of unbelief is refusal to repent refusing to repent is a sign of unbelief where i don't want you know where i think you know repentance no 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 sorry i don't want to change i don't want to turn back to god it's a sign of unbelief and so it brings us condemnation the second thing so the first unbelief brings us condemnation second unbelief hinders you from receiving the promises of god in your life it will hinder you from receiving what what you won't receive what god has promised you the promises of god in your life okay let me give you the example in hebrews chapter 3 letter to the hebrews chapter 3 verse 19 it is said about the people of israel it is talking about the people of israel now we let's know this story the people of israel we all know were in in the book of exodus they were in egypt and they were in bondage god sends moses and delivers them from pharaoh okay from the land of bondage now god and he brings them out god brings the people of israel out of egypt because he wants to bring them in the land of canaan the plan of god was to bring them in the land of canaan in so god brings us out so that he can bring us in and that's what happened in the book of exodus god god brings the people of israel out of the land of bondage that is egypt delivers them from the hand of pharaoh because he wanted to bring them in the land of canaan that was god's plan for their life the land of canaan now all of us are interested in coming out of our problems huh? we are not interested in coming in the kingdom in we just want you know god just get me out of the problem you know just get me out and then leave me after you bring me out of the problem leave me i i want to live my life as i want but just just god just fix this problem uh, get me out of this mess but we are not interested we are all looking for to come out we are not interested in coming in the kingdom now the people of israel when they were delivered from the land of egypt they we all know they passed through the desert they crossed the red sea and then they were in the desert in numbers chapter 13 we have the story of the people of israel they have come on the border towards the border of the land of canaan and moses there sends 12 spies we know that story 12 spies to spy out the land now a very important spiritual lesson there is god is giving the people of israel the land but he expects them to go and find out about the land which means there is something god has to do there is something they have to do what god will do <clears throat> god is giving them the land of canaan what they have to do they have to get information about the land to get information is their job that god won't do so i always talk about faith and responsibility in my talks faith is what god will do responsibility is what you are supposed to do so that's just a spiritual lesson for us to learn now the people of israel the 12 spies go into the land of canaan they spy the land out and after 40 days they come back and now they are reporting to the people of israel and they say the land is good the land is good let's look at how unbelief was seen in their life 
because hebrews 3 chapter 3 verse 19 says because of their unbelief they never received the promises of god what god had promised them the land of canaan that was the promise god had given them that i will give you a very good land you all are slaves you all don't have any land of your own i'll give you the best land the best land on the earth the land of canaan i will give you that but they never received what god had promised why because of unbelief let's see how their unbelief was shown we think unbelief is all about in my mind i don't believe no 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 unbelief is also not doing what god tells you to do i repeat again unbelief is also not doing what god tells you to do now they come back the 12 spies come and they say the land is good it is really good land but there are giants in the land and we were like grasshoppers before them and so they are now putting fear this was a fact huh? there were giants in the land that was a fact and but now they are trying to put fear into the hearts of the people of israel and all the people of israel given to fear and unbelief only two of them that is joshua and caleb they say yes there are giants in the land yes god's plan has got big problems that's the meaning god's plan has big problems also but when god is on our side we can win with god we will win but the people of israel decide not to believe joshua and caleb they believe the 10 spies who are giving all the negative report and now listen to this how was their unbelief shown their unbelief was shown by refusing to fight god wanted them to go into the land of canaan and fight the battle fight to possess that blessing they had to fight and a refusal to fight they wanted that blessing to come on the plate name it claim it by their refusal to fight and joshua and caleb are saying let's go and fight god is on our side and we will fight by their refusal to fight they showed their unbelief the very important lesson that i want to draw to you is sometimes your relationship with god goes through such a difficulty let me give an example you may be spending daily time in prayer but now your prayer time is going very dry you are not able to feel the presence of god in your prayer time and you feel like giving up your prayer time now because you don't feel all that current going through your hand and you know you don't feel all that peace and all which you used to feel at one particular time and you feel like giving up your prayer time that's the time you need to fight for your prayer time there are going to be times in our life where we have to fight to maintain our relationship with god because it's going to become difficult it's going to become difficult to walk with god and we fight because we believe a god gives us victory the people of israel showed their unbelief by their refusal to fight because perhaps they were like us you know name it claim it and have it on the plate it will come easily to you on the plate you don't need to even fight i know there are times where god wants us to stand still stand still which he told moses stand still and you will see the victory of the lord that was only once stand still but the rest of the scripture is if you read the entire old testament go and fight you have to fight and the refusal to fight was a refusal to believe in god that god can give you the victory so we we don't receive the promises of god what god has promised us when we refuse to fight i remember um, 24 years ago when i was taking my decision to get into full time ministry those few those few uh, two years when i it took me two years to discern and make a decision it was like a battle for me it was one of the most difficult battles i have ever fought because it was a major decision 
uh, I'm not going to work. I'm just going to serve the Lord. And it was not me taking a decision. It was the Lord who was leading me to take the decision because that was my promised land, full-time ministry. And it was not easy to make that decision. I know the struggles I went through. I Actually, I wanted to work. I was just 30, married only for six months. And I felt that's not the time to get into full-time ministry. I know people will often say, if I tell them I'm getting into full-time ministry, many people, and they said also, he doesn't want to work. He doesn't, he's not interested in going to work. And in the name of God, he's found an easy escape, full-time ministry. At that particular time, you know, when some people in Bombay, whom I was talking with, were telling me, yes, they also felt, they also felt in my heart, in their heart that God is calling me for that. That's the way we discern. Not only we take the decision, but we allow, we have some people of God in our lives who are very close to us, who have grown spiritually, and then they help us to discern. And then they also confirm that, yes, God is calling you. So I still remember, uh, I went to Porta for a retreat, took my wife and we went to Porta. I says, you know, in Bombay, I think so people here know me. And so they, they think, you know, I should get into full-time business. Let's go in a place where no one knows us. So we went to Porta for a retreat. It was uh, May, the end of May, where they have this family retreat, 19, year 1999. And me and my wife were attending the retreat. There was a speaker there named, by name Brother Fritz Mascarinus. Some of us may be knowing. You know, he was a very powerful speaker. One of the most uh, powerful person in the, in the charismatic renewal in those days. Very powerful speaker. Another full-timer. And I went to him on the fifth day just to talk with him. And I was talking to him about my decision for full-time ministry. He prayed over me. And he just got a vision. And he says, I see a vision. Two doors. I see two doors. One door God has closed. And you're trying to open it, it won't open. And another door God is opening. So what you, actually the vision meant was, uh, your door to the secular world is closed. You won't get a job. You, even if you try, you won't get. And God is opening a door. The door, door was a full-time ministry. And after he prayed over me, this brother did an act of faith. I still remember this. He took a 500 rupee note and he says, I just want to give it to you because this is the first installment that God is calling you to trust him to provide for your needs. And I just feel in my heart to give this to you. Please keep it because the Holy Spirit is telling me to give it to you. And he just gave it to me. That was a word of encouragement for me. You know, I said, this brother hardly knows me. I've come and met him for the first time. And here, you know, the Lord is leading. He's also a full-timer and the Lord is leading him to become the first person who will support me financially. Of course, he never did that, but that was the first person who ever gave me anything. So I said, oh, this brother, you know, he's also saying that. So I decided to go to Father Augustine Valoran for counseling at that time because I wanted, you know, the problem is I'm going, <clears throat> sometimes we are like that. We are changing counselors because they are not telling us what we want to hear. Okay, they are not telling us what we want to hear. We have already decided in our mind, sometimes, you know, what, what they should tell us. And we keep on changing the counselors till we don't hear one counselor exactly telling us what is in our mind. So I went to Father Augustine Valorun and I met him. I remember he was going in his room on the staircase and I met him and I, I started talking to him about my call for full time. And he immediately said, uh, no, 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 you know, lay people are usually not called into full time. It's better you look out for a job. Even Paul worked. So you also work. I was very happy. I said, at last, you know, I got a priest. You know, he, he's told me to work. I must listen to a priest, not to any lay person. And Father Augustine Valorun has said this. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I said, I was very happy. I shook hands with him. So, Father, thank you for your guidance. And I came down in my room. When I came down in my room, my wife had purchased a cross, a crucifix, from one of the shops there at the Divine Retreat Center. And she said, Are uh, we need to bless this cross. Let's get this cross. The crosses are there are already blessed, but she wanted to get it blessed again from Father Augustine Valorun. So he tells me, just go and let's go and meet Father Augustine and tell him to bless the cross. So I said, yeah, yeah, come, let's go. And we went to his room with the cross. Father Augustine saw me. He was talking to someone. He saw me and immediately said, you, you know, young man, just come here. Just wait. I want to talk to you. 
and he was he's finished this conversation with that other brother and then he called me in his room and he says you are the same person who met me on the staircase and you were talking about the full time ministry i said yes father what happened he says after i spoke to you what you had spoken to me you must go to work he said after i spoke to you i felt the holy spirit telling me in my heart that yes you have a call for full time ministry the call is there and so i wanted to tell you the spirit spoke to my heart the call is there you need to be open my face again fell down i says in 10 minutes the spirit just changed you know made father agustin change his mind of course we blessed the crucifix we came down and then we were back on our trip to mumbai i had a few days left in which i had to make my decision i just i called that incident in my life i just decided to get out of my boat and walk on the water i thank god that he gave me that grace at that particular time to get out of my boat all the plans i had for my life and step on the water trusting god for his provision in my life today 24 years have gone and one of the passage that encouraged me was at that time to really step out of the boat was this passage uh, about the people of israel i says 40 years god took care of them in the desert desert is a place where no food grows nothing grows no shop is there no pizza hut is there <laughs> and for 40 years god saw that 6 million people had breakfast snacks and tea at 10 o'clock lunch at 1 o'clock some snacks and tea at 4 o'clock i'm just i'm just saying what happens in the retreat center huh? and dinner at 8 o'clock 40 years and it says and this people were not able to trust god fully and if god could take care of them for 40 years how much more god will take care of me i decided to step into my promised land it's 24 years now <laughs> i sometimes tell my wife 16 years still left because 40 was the figure 24 years now i am in my 25th year of my full time ministry walking in the promises of god i just wonder if i would have said no to god at that time and decided to go to work i don't know which part which company which which place i would have been i don't know whether i would be today speaking to y'all unbelief will hinder you from receiving the promises of god third unbelief will hinder from god hinder god from doing all his work in your life i repeat again unbelief will hinder god from doing all his work in your life what do i mean by that god works in our life and he does some things but he is not when we don't believe in him god is not able to do everything he wants to do because we restrict him through unbelief take for example god wanted to do 100 things but because of my unbelief he is only able to do 30 the 70 things more things that he wants to do he is not able to do because i am not cooperating with him god is not able to do all that he wants to do so here and there i experience god huh? but all that god wants to do what are some of the things what are some of all the things god wants to do god wants to convert me god wants me to grow spiritually god wants me to become his instrument ah many of us are not interested in that oh god keep that for someone else especially the speaker who is speaking keep all that for him conversion spiritual growth ministry no no, no not me lord uh, you just fix my problem there is verse in the new testament matthew chapter 13 was 58 Matthew chapter 13 verse 58 it says Jesus came to his hometown Nazareth because Jesus was in Nazareth and it says he was not able to do all that he wanted to do 
He did only some miracles there, only a few miracles there, and he was not able to do more. What does it mean? Jesus perhaps wanted to do much more things in his hometown than what he did, but he was only able to do few miracles. Why? It says because of their unbelief. Read that verse, Matthew thirteen fifty eight. Because of their unbelief, and in the same way, because of our unbelief, God is not able to do everything He wants us to do. Yes, we sometimes restrict God only to do blessings, and so God is only able to do that. You know, just just give me what I need, just solve the problem I am in, just fix it up, God, and converting my life. No, 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 don't do that. Leave me alone. I think so. I am good enough. Uh, helping me to grow spiritually? No, no, no. Sorry, not interested, God. Uh, as long as you fix my problem, I don't need to grow. I think so. I am already strong. And God, you want me to become your instrument? You want me to become a source of blessing to other people? Sorry, God. You know, I have no time for all that. So God is not able to do everything He wants us to. He wants to do in my life. He'll only do something. That's the third effect of unbelief. God is not able to do all His work in my life. The fourth effect of unbelief: uh, unbelief. <clears throat> unbelief will make me ineffective in my ministry. Unbelief will make me ineffective in my ministry. In Matthew chapter seventeen, verse nineteen to twenty-one, we have a father. A man who brought his son to the disciples of Jesus. We know this story to cast out a demon, and the disciples couldn't cast it out. Now we have to understand this passage. Huh? To understand Matthew chapter seventeen, you must know what has happened in Matthew chapter ten. So in Matthew chapter ten, Jesus calls his disciples and he gives them power and authority. Two things he gives them: he gives them power to heal and the authority to cast out demons. And he sends them out two by two, and we know that story. They went into the villages, they preached, they healed people. When they laid their hands on people, people were healed. The evil spirits ran away when they prayed in authority. So that's what happens in Matthew chapter ten. Jesus has given the apostles the charisms of healing and deliverance. They had the charism. Now in Matthew chapter seventeen, the charism is not working. they are not able to cast out the evil spirit which means they had the charism but the charism is not working it is not getting effective so this father tells the jesus he has come remember the story of the mount of transfiguration jesus has come down from the mountain and this is what is happening down the father comes to jesus says i brought my son to your apostles and they were not able to cast out the devil so jesus has get him to me and jesus then cast out the evil spirit now peter and company that is peter and all the other apostles after seeing that this is the question that is going on in their mind how do i know that because look at what they are asking jesus they are asking jesus means what let's look at first what is going on in their mind what is going on in the mind of the apostles are right. we have the same charism that jesus has <coughs> Jesus has given us the same power and authority, same charisms Jesus has given us. How come his charism worked? My charism is not working. Our charism is not working, and his charism worked. We have the same charisms, and so that is what they are asking Jesus. You know, in verse nineteen, why could not we cast it out? so jesus said to them because of your unbelief because of your unbelief now how was their unbelief seen remember unbelief is all as faith is a action word which means if you have faith show it don't say it faith is not saying faith is showing that's what james says faith without works is dead if you have faith show it don't say it show it show your works in the same way unbelief is seen now how was the apostles unbelief seen in mark chapter 9 where we have the same story 
Jesus tells the apostles, this kind, which means there are some specific demons who are so strong, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So how did the apostles show their unbelief? The apostle says, we have charism. That's enough. The apostles had charism, but anointing on the charism. Sometimes it's not charism is required. Anointed charism is required. Because this kind, this kind, there are some special problems, special demonic forces. This kind, Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. A charism should be backed up by a life of prayer and by a life of fasting. That's where the anointing on the charism comes. And the apostles just wanted to have charism without a life of prayer and without a life of fasting, life of self-denial. And so when we, when we refuse, when we show unbelief, we become ineffective in ministry. <clears throat> That's the fourth point. God won't be able to work through us and do everything he wants to do through us. Our charisms won't work. <clears throat> and that's why sometimes we find some people are very good in singing, very good in singing. Some of them are anointed in singing. Some people are just good in giving a talk. Others are anointed in their talk. When they speak, the heart is touched. Life is transformed because they have an anointing on their session. I often say charism is free. Anointing is costly. And so one of the costs of anointing is a life of prayer and a life of fasting. Let's look at the third point. Psychology. Why we fall in unbelief? Why? Why I struggle? We saw the main spirit. We saw the spiritual lesson, spiritual part, that because we don't know God, that was a spiritual aspect. Let's look at the psychological aspect. Why we struggle with unbelief? What are some of the reasons? In fact, there are top four reasons why people find it difficult to believe in God. Four reasons. I'm talking here about people who are having a relationship with God. Okay, and we, we are, you know, it, it may be any one of us here. We are having a relationship with God and we are walking with the Lord. But when it comes to believe in him, we find it very, very difficult to believe in him. Why? Why do you find it difficult? What has happened in our life that makes us difficult to believe God? And there are four reasons why we find it difficult to believe God. Topmost reason is pride. Because pride says, I am enough. I'm sufficient. I don't need God in my life. I've got brains. I've got intelligence. I can solve my problems. I don't need God. I'm enough. So that's the first reason. Uh, I know many on this group who are listening to me today. You don't fall on this category. Because the very fact you are here shows you're telling God, God, I'm not enough. I need you. Okay, so let's rejoice. You know, we, we don't fall in that first category, ah, but we can fall in the next three categories. The second reason I want you to listen to carefully because I want you to understand yourself. You know, one of the best things we can sometimes do is understand why I'm struggling. Why do I struggle? You know, why, why in the world I go through that struggle rather than condemning yourself? Why oh, I'm finding it difficult to believe, difficult to believe. Ah, please stop condemning yourself and start understanding yourself. Start understanding yourself. Because God wants you to understand yourself, why you are struggling with. The second main reason why we struggle with in the time of, with unbelief is because the waiting period, we have gone through a time called the waiting period, has been longer than we what we expected. Now, what do I mean? The waiting period has been longer than what we expected. Now, please listen to me. What do I mean by that? There is some problem in my life that I've been praying for years. 
there is some need in my life and i have been praying for years and each one of us has got one at least one if you ask me yes there is one problem i have been praying for the last 37 years being in the charismatic renewal 37 years i have been praying nothing has happened the problem continues it was just two weeks back i was telling my wife that i just now realize that that's my cross that that problem is my cross i have to carry it daily i just realized that and so each one of us has got something one need one problem that we have been asking god for so many years we have been praying to god for so many years and god doesn't seem to do anything about it you are just waiting and the waiting period as it goes gets longer and longer which means your answer is not coming the answer you are expecting is not coming we are tempted to think god is not interested about this problem in fact god is not interested in taking this problem out of my life it looks like he is not interested in this problem at all our condition becomes like abraham at the age of 75 god tells him you will have a son he keeps on waiting and waiting and waiting no wonder in genesis chapter 16 Sarah his wife comes and tells him how long will we wait perhaps god needs our help so you marry my servant hagar and have a child through her and that will be my son that will be my child the waiting period had become so long that abraham gave into unbelief he marries hagar and god tells no sorry not through hagar you will have a child only through sara but that was a mistake then and that's what happens today i want you to become aware is there something you have been waiting for quite long the waiting period has become very long years you have been praying for someone you have been praying for some need you have been asking god for some problem something and nothing is happening about it and we can be tempted to fall into unbelief but i want to tell you right now i spoke about my problem 37 years and sometimes it is so easy to just focus on that one problem you know the god has not done anything about it but on the other hand i can see god doing so many other things in my life but our brain is such our brain is such it won't show you what god is doing what are the other good things god has blessed you with our brain won't show us our brain all the time will take us into the negative aspect it will show us what we don't have and what is happening what is the wrong thing that is happening in my life what i don't have and what i'm going through your brain will never tell you to come on let's take time to reflect what you have and sometimes there is only one area in my life where god is doing nothing other areas god is working but we can get so tempted to focus on this one area because it is very important for us and we try to assume god is not interested the waiting period is got longer than it is expected has it happened with you and that's why you are tempted not to believe in the lord okay not to believe in the lord my answer for you is please look at the other things god is doing in your life the other ways god is blessing the other areas of your life where god is blessing so that you get balanced okay you get balanced but if you are just going to focus on this one area of waiting and keep on saying when will god do this when will god do this when will i get what i am expecting i'll tell you you are becoming a candidate for unbelief now why god is taking me through that waiting period is a mystery huh? i hope so i get no questions here on this point
<laughs> why god is not answering uh, I, i when we go to heaven we can ask god you know why you took such a such a long time i'm going to ask god why 37 years uh, this problem never change and after 37 years i get a inspiration like that is my cross i i like to there are some questions we when we go to heaven we can ask god huh? please write them down and keep it, uh, take it along with you to heaven <laughs> we can ask god he will clarify then we will understand <laughs> because god's wisdom is amazing god is remember god is more wiser than you and me huh? don't ever think that you have ever become a wiser than god huh? and god is wrong he is waiting you know something is wrong with him hello god is more wiser than you even is waiting is something wise because god is only wisdom <laughs> only it's only we and i who are like fools sometimes only god is all wise so even is waiting has some wisdom we will come to know when we go to heaven so let's wait till there and let's trust him for this waiting let's trust him the third reason why we fall in unbelief psychological reason because sometimes the problems in our life are bigger the problems we are going through in our life are bigger than our resources and our strength what do i mean by that our condition is like the people of israel in numbers chapter 14 when they had gone out to spy and they came back with this report the land is good but there are giants in the land and we were like grasshoppers look at what they are saying we were like grasshoppers before them which means what does it meaning the problems we are going to face are greater than the resources we have which means we don't have the resources to face the problem uh, is greater than the strength we have the you know we don't have that strength to face this problem and to go through this but we forget it's not about our resources and our strength it's god a song comes to my mind as i say this god is the strength of my heart 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 he is our strength and sometimes we compare the problem with our resources and our strength and we feel oh i can't get over this i am finished i like to end up with this session because next week i'll take on how we overcome unbelief the fourth reason why we fall in unbelief is people sometimes we have people close who are close to us people who are close to us who make us tempt to fall in unbelief sometimes the closest people we have tempt us to fall into unbelief one of the things we need to watch out one of the things we really need to watch out is who is close to us because the people who are close to us if they are not people of faith if they are not people of faith they are going to affect our faith now i know some of us will say my family members don't believe in god yes you can have a family of course and physically you all are close to each other but who asked you that in your faith life faith life this will be the people who should be close because they they don't have a faith life the faith life is absent in their life and remember this people and what they say are close to you let me give two example from the scripture one is the example of sarah abraham made a mistake because the person close to him sarah advised him to marry hagar and it's so natural for us to immediately accept the advice of people who are so close to us why their intentions are so good they will never think bad about us but we forget sometimes what they may be telling us may not be what god wants to tell us because it's not coming they they don't have a life of faith at all the second example of people close to us affecting our faith making us fall in unbelief is job's wife the book of job after job went all through all those problems we read in job chapter 2 verse 9 where the wife of job tells him do you still hold on to your integrity curse god and die 
means job you know what you are holding on to your integrity integrity means you are still holding on to your faith in god you gone mad job look at all that you have lost how can god do this to you how can god allow this to you and you are still holding on to your faith job i suggest curse god and die but job never allowed his wife's word to affect him and sometimes it can happen people who are close to us they keep on telling us that faith in god won't help you believing god won't help you okay you you have to do something for yourself and i right i'm right in one way they are right some things we have to do but it's our faith in god i remember our christian life is faith and responsibility god has to do his part and i have to do my part but they will tell us god won't do anything huh? you only have to do god won't come down to help you and suddenly because these people are so close to us their words start affecting us i like to end up with a uh, incident about my dad my dad came to the charismatic renewal in the year 1984 and he was the first one to be touched by the family in fact we were so upset with his change that he changed so much we should have been happy but we were so upset that he started putting god first in his life giving tithes serving god but also taking good care of us huh? we never had a complaint but we never liked his spirituality so what happened all three of us the other three members in the family started persecuting him including myself even i used to say things to him sometimes that were very hurtful and sometimes in the morning prayer time i used to see my dad in tears like he's sitting for prayer and there are tears rolling down his eyes i thought perhaps dad is you know going through some problem in his life that's why he is you know having tears i never realized it was me and the other members in the family who are putting him down who are hurting him by what we say then one day suddenly you know one day suddenly we saw a dramatic change in him he used to never get affected with what we say no matter what negative things we said he was okay after i came to the lord and after i was touched by the lord i asked him dad what happened first he used to get you know used to cry he says i used to cry in my prayer time because you people used to say things that were very hurting he used to say things about jesus and used to say things about spiritual life that were very hurting so i used to cry out before the lord then one day the lord told me disconnect yourself emotionally from your family disconnect yourself emotionally from your family why because the words of your family are affecting you because you are expecting you are expecting them to support you to buy be by your side give up your expectations disconnect yourself from your family emotionally dad says i did that and you know what he did he used to attend a prayer meeting the prayer group members became a spiritual family oh <laughs> they used to come on his birthdays on his wedding anniversaries and we used to get more upset but they became like his family here god his earthly family was getting separated and here he got a bigger spiritual family more members in the family and he started being very happy with this spiritual family very happy no wonder jesus said you know if you have given up your father mother brother sister you will have more than 100 and sometimes sometimes you know i do not know some of you may be having someone at home who is constantly putting you down with their words like job's wife discouraging you it's time and it's affecting you. if it's affecting you today god is saying to you disconnect disconnect yourself emotionally from that family when people close to us say things to us say things to us like job's wife we can get affected and we can fall in unbelief time is up i want to stop here uh, next week i'll take part 2 of this teaching five ways sorry five ways five specific ways we can overcome 
unbelief in our life. And I hope to see each one of you there. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this morning. We praise you and thank you for this word. This teaching, Lord, on overcoming unbelief. Thank you for giving us clarity. Thank you for helping us to understand ourselves. Lord, even our unbelief, you don't condemn us, but you constantly encourage us to, to humble ourselves, to look and understand ourselves, why we fall in unbelief. Perhaps the waiting period has been long. Perhaps people who are close to us, Lord, are constantly nagging and discouraging us, our spiritual life. For them, Lord, we are wasting our life because we can earn so much else in the world. Lord, perhaps it is sometimes our own pride. Lord, we pray that you will help us through this teaching to root out, root out the sin of unbelief from our life. All Lord, we pray that we will take our relationship with you seriously because the more we know you, Lord, the more easier it is to have trust in you, to have faith in you. I know, Lord, when two weeks back you spoke to me that this is my cross, uh, I just accepted it, Lord, because I know you won't do anything in my life to harm me. Even this thing, Lord, this 37 years of waiting is for my good. Some spiritual good it will bring in my life. I was able to trust you, Lord, because 37 years, Lord, it has taken me to know you. Truly, Lord, when we know you, we become strong in the time of testing. I pray for all my brothers and sisters that we will take our relationship with you seriously. We will take knowing you seriously in our life. We make this prayer, Father, in the most precious name of Jesus, through the intercession of Mary, our beloved mother, and through the intercession of all the angels and saints. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Victor. Thank you. Thank you.